Uh, hello, uh, we are going to start uh, our second uh, guest lecture by Fernando Ortiz uh, Moya uh, from the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, uh, an institute uh, in Japan. Uh, although as uh, well, those of you who uh, watched uh, the, uh, the previous lecture, you know that he has a very international background. He's from Spain. Um, he uh, became an architect in Spain and later uh, he, he studied in, in the UK uh, where he uh, completed his studies on human geography. Later, uh, he came to Japan uh, to complete his uh, doctoral degree. And later also he was teaching in China after coming back again uh, uh, to Japan. So a very, very international background. And uh, last week we were talking about uh, more like uh, the uh, current uh, challenges of shrinking cities in general. But uh, this week we are going to talk uh, more uh, about alternatives. So last week was more like understanding from a more theoretical point of view, uh, what, what are the origins and the current situation of shrinking cities. And this week we are we would like to talk about what we can do about that. Sorry, uh, so it's it's going to be like well, uh, not solutions. I don't like so much the concept of finding a solution itself, but alternatives, new ways of thinking uh, about uh, shrinking cities. So, uh, Fernando, uh, whenever you are ready, we can start. And thank you again for coming and and lecturing for us. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Jorge, indeed, and um, hello, everybody. Uh, so as first, let me thank Jorge for inviting me to be here today. And uh, as he mentioned, uh, today we are going to be talking about new under understandings of planning alternatives to shrinking cities, and we are going to do so through case studies in Japan. So uh, while while last week's research was a, was a research that I've been doing since my PhD studies, uh, today's presentation is going to be based on more recent research that I've been developing um, together with a colleague in the University of Strathclyde, uh, Marco Reggiani, and also with a colleague in the USA, Sara Silov. So I am combining both um, part of my ongoing work on how Japanese cities are redefining what it means to shrink. Um, so first, uh, we are going to talk about the growth ideology, and we are going to discuss why growth is the normative development for most cities. Then we will reinforce the idea of shrinking Japan once again. And then we are going to talk about two different case studies. One is Yubari City. Uh, then we will talk about Imabetsu town. And then we will finish with an open question, is what now? Which it's a question we all have to know. And then you can see a um, question and answer. So let us move on and first talk about the growth ideology. So as we mentioned last week, Shrinking City is an urban area that is experiencing population and economic decline due to ongoing challenges in, changes in the global economy. And the main problem is like usually shrinkage is perceived as a sign, symptom of crisis, something undesirable, side effect of failed economic and policy. So we can see here the language is very but crisis, failed economic and political uh, policy. It's something you don't want to be said about anything, like you don't want to be considered a failure, you don't want to be in crisis. So the main implication of this is that most of the strategies to a shrinking to a shrinkage are based on returning to growing economic and population figures. So even when you are managing shrinkage, there is different academic papers that argue that even when you are trying to stabilize the population, that is still part of a hidden progress agenda in which the ultimate goal, maybe longer term, is to go back to growth. 
as we talked last year, la, la, no, not last year, last week, uh, policy and planning lack specific tools to confront decline. And we were mentioning that there is two main approaches, which can be pro-growth or decline management. So pro-growth approaches are, as I mentioned, very directly trying to bring back growth through physical regeneration, economic development. We mentioned, for example, the competition among American cities, many of them are shrinking cities like, like Pittsburgh, uh, trying to compete to attract Amazon's headquarters. City branding, we know how many Japanese municipalities are creating cute characters to brand themselves. Manchester, when it was at its lowest part, it was trying to create a new image for itself and also hosting mega events. On the other hand, we have decline management, which in theory means that the city is assuming shrinkage as the possible development future, and they try to implement fiscal austerity to reduce the municipal expenses to match their decreased tax revenues, right sizing, which very simply, you have a city that before used to live 10,000 people. So there was 7,000 houses. Now you have 6,000 people. Do you need that many houses? Probably not. So you have to diminish the physical part of the city. And then we have land banks, which is a mechanism for cities to um, to uh, re uh, appropriate that abandoned land and then bring it back to the market. But as we also discussed last, last week, we it's like both replicate planning tools used in growing cities. So growing cities also do physical regeneration, uh, economic development. So in the end, the Amazon headquarters were to Arlington in Virginia, which is a city that is growing. Also city branding and mega like city branding, then Olympic Games happen in Tokyo, which is growing. The next Olympics Games are going to happen in Paris and LA and mega events. So it's something that keeps happening in both cities. So the main difference between pro-growth and decline management is their focus. So pro-growth are really very, very hardcore trying to bring back growth while the clan management is more like a palliative treatment. They are trying to fix the situation little by little and try to sustain quality of life while the population keeps, uh, keeps still living there. So the main idea is to think more into the people living there, but the ultimate goal is like once the living conditions improve, hopefully people will realize and will move back to that city. So even though they are always trying to compete, there is this um, belief that in the end, population might hopefully come back. So one of the questions of the growth ideology is that it is believed to be a religion. I think that one of the main problems for the shrinking cities nowadays is that there is no alternative to growth. Our growth is a belief. There is a belief that growth is necessary, that there is no life without growth, or that there is no alternative to growth. So it is something that people have stopped questioning. And even though growth doesn't need to be good necessarily, and also there is an important difference, there might be, um, quantitative growth, which is something we've seen very recently all over the world, when the population, when the growth might happen, the GDP might be growing, but there is no qualitative growth. So growth happens, especially in economic terms, but that's only happening for a, a small segment of the population. Let's see Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, but everybody else doesn't see that growth reflected in their life. So this belief for growth, it works for a few of people, but not for everybody. And just to show how this is ingrained. So in Detroit, and I'm sure you know Detroit as one of the foremost examples of shrinking cities. So Detroit 
like Ubari, also went bankrupt and was the largest or most, most famous city in the US going bankrupt. And Mayor McDougan was elected in January 2014 as the first post bankruptcy mayor. And he stated in an interview in the Wall Street Journal on June 22, so around, I think, six months after he was elected, that the single standard a mayor should be defined on is whether the population of the city is going up or going down. Let's the single standard. So it's not like one of the standards, an important standard. This is, is like the only standard for your um, um, policies is going to be whether your population is going up or down. And I don't want to be bad, but during his term, the population has decreased by 10%. Uh, not, uh, I, I don't want to put salt into the ground, ground but he, according to his own standard, he seems to be failing. It's true that between 20, um, 20, 2000 and the 2010, the population declined by 20%. So he stopped the depopulation, but still he is not performing well according to his own standard and another thing that is very important for cities is something called urban growth machines and that's another of the points of why growth is so ingrained in municipal uh, in municipal policies is that cities create these uh, machines figurative machines that to promote growth between public and private entities that create, that try to create the dynamics to favor investment and provide public services for those investments to, to thrive. And while at the same time also creating a huge inter-urban and inter-regional competition, we know how cities nowadays compete for investment and there are all these reasons, all these fights to attract those companies and investors. So, for example, in Europe, when Brexit happened, happened, there was a conversation between the different European capitals trying to attract some of the business from the UK to, to gain that access to the economic European economic market and also benefit their cities. So there, there was a lot of competition between Paris, Madrid, Barcelona, uh, Dublin in Ireland trying to bring the companies that were supposed to leave the UK. So there is always cities are competing and are trying to attract a limited number of resources. So that also creates this anxiety for cities that if you are not growing, if you are not perceived as dynamic, you will lose the game and then your whole city will collapse. So it's this kind of uh, if you watch Indiana Jones, when Indiana Jones is running with the big rock behind him, and he cannot, he just needs to focus to the front and keep running. So it's kind of the same theory. You have no alternative to grow. And today we are going to focus on Japan. And why in Japan? As we discussed last week, Japan is experiencing severe very ex extreme shrinkage. Uh, you can see in this map in the last 10 years, uh, uh, Aomori, Akita, Kochi, Fukushima, they have experienced very severe uh, shrinkage, over 10%, which is a very uh, strong uh, decline. And there are two dynamics at place. First, there is a special distribution of the population when there is this tendency to concentrate in the Tokyo metropolitan area. And I don't know how many of you are from Tokyo, Kanagawa, uh, Saitama, Chiba, or are for prefectures farther away. And also there is this demographic change. So there is population aging. So Japanese population is one of the, the first or the second with the longest life expectancy. So people live longer, but also there are low birth rates and the replacement level. So if you want to retain the population of a country, the birth rate is supposed to be 2.01 children per woman. So every woman should be having 2.1 children to keep the population at the same level. Once 
that I mean, of course, this array, like a woman can have three children and one woman can have one, and that can balance out. Or, but the situation in Japan is that birth rates are a historical low level around 1.25. So ultimately, there will be this natural population decline. And the third reason is restrictive immigration policy. So there is like, while in other countries like the USA or the UK, it's, or Spain as well, it's very easy to move in. And there is a huge percentage of the foreign population. In Japan, it is a very small number. And the situation, as you can see here, is that the Japanese population is gonna se severely decrease. And only if the, if, if the birth rate reaches again replacement level by in the next 10, 20 years, the population will stabilize around 100 million. Mm -hmm. But if the birth rate continues as it is now, you can see that very deep diving line. And this is an official projection from the Japan, from the government of Japan. And in Japan, there, there are like a different understanding. So I don't know if you have read of what is called the Masuda Report. The Masuda Report is a book written by the former governor of Iwate, of, of Iwate Ken. And the Masuda Report was published in 2014 and it really, really created a sense of urgency. Although the issue of the population was before, and there was talk about the caso problem or vanishing regions, the Masuda report really highlight what has been called double negative demographic disequilibrium. So what happens of the spatial concentration in Tokyo and the low birth rate? So that creates a very strong disequilibrium with um, is uh, damaging. Uh, it's li li limiting the, um, the opportunities for development of the areas. And then as Masuda uh, named it, it results in vanishing areas, shometsu in Japanese. That was the word he was using. Because these places will sooner or later disappear. There is a critical point when there are no more options for them to live, for them to succeed. And there are very strong uh, top-down responses, especially by the Cabinet Office, Office for Promotion of Regional Revitalization, which is supporting the development of policies for the regional cities to stabilize their populations, including revitalization plans, a strong pronatalist approach. So one of the main ideas is to bring back birth rates a supposedly a focus on decentralization, trying to bring economic activity outside of Tokyo, and also other special programs, such as the SDGs Future City program, which aims at bringing sustainable development to, to areas, to all over Japan, but also to help to bring back economic activity. And other ministries, such for example, the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport, has presented the Compact City Plan. All the Ministry of Environment of Japan has created the concept of the circulating and ecological economy to also hoping to bring back growth to these areas. So there are all these policies that are in place. And especially many of them has appeared in the last 10 years, hoping to reverse the effects of what we show before. But this Top-down responses are still reinforcing the stigma censoring cage, and their main objective is to halt the decline of the population. And then there are different voices that has questioned in this approach, claiming that we cannot continue trying to foster uh, to foster the uh, growth. And there are alternative visions that are happening and planning models, such for example, uh, Peter Matanley from Sheffield University developed something called the population dividend. That is the belief that the idea that um, the population might have more benefits than harms, especially environmental benefits. And then the big question is like, that is facing Japan is like, what do what to do when shrinkage is unavoidable? Because Japan is going to shrink, 
there is no question about that. There is nothing that is going to change that. There is not going to be a massive influx of millions of immigrants every year to overcome this. And do pro-growth policies make sense anymore? And if so, what kind of pro-growth policies? And finally, the other important question, like, is it possible to manage a soft landing? So, you know, when you are, your plane is crashing, you need to try at least to balance so saving as many people as possible. And how is that going to look? How are you going to maintain public services? How are you going to maintain public pensions? How are you going to maintain quality of life? So, and the more important question that you should, that I'm going to ask you at, at the end of the class, so we start thinking about it. What can architects and those architecture do to manage this? Because what is the role of architects as agents that has capacity to shape cities? So now we are going to talk about two case studies that are, have started to reimagine this. So one is Ubari City. Uh, if you have ever been to Ubari uh, or not, so Ubari City was a city built on coal. Um, so it was found coal during the Meiji period in the area, and then the city really rapidly grew. And if you can see, this is the map of the city. You can see how it is not kind of the normal compact city you usually imagine. It's very dispersed structure with different settlements. And that's because back in the days, the communities were settling in Yubari near a mine. So you can see like all the different communities. It's because there was a map, an entrance to a mine. So people could go easily to work. And this organic and unplanned growth uh, shaped the city with this uh, sh shape. We have a shape, the city and the different communities develop, and then there was a structural system that uh, merged it together. Also, uh, I don't know if the quality of the image you are seeing is good enough, but this is a very, the geography, it's, there are many mountains, so basically the city is also taking the valley area. So there was not, I, I will share the slides later on with you so you can look more closely, but if, I don't know if you can see my, my pointer, but there are like many, it's very, very stiff mountain. So literally the city is in the only part where there was enough flat land to actually build houses and develop communities. It's, I think you can see more or less in this picture what I was saying, you have the mountains and the communities were happening um, uh, organically. So the city was in full development mode until the 1950s and the population peaked in 1960 at around 110,000 people, which is a fairly large size city. But at that time, and that's something that um, we talked also with Kitaki Yushi before, like Japan changed the energy policy towards favoring oil, which reduced, not, not reduced, took away the, economic, the necessity of the collapse the, of coal, and most mining towns towns collapsed, which is similar to Gunkanjima, as we talked last class. So Yubari, also similar to Gunkanjima, didn't have many more additional economic activities. It has a certain agricultural sector, but the agricultural sector and people working in agriculture and people working in the mines were not very connected. And also the, um, this created a whole collapse of the economic system, which prompted people to move out of the city, and then the total uh, decline. So the current estimate of September 30 this year, it's like the population is 7,144 people. So you can make the math. In 50, 60 years, the city has lost 93, 94% of its population, which Detroit has lost around 60%. So Yubari is probably one of the most shrunk cities in the world, which still has some people living there. So during the 80s and the 90s, I'm sure you are familiar with the economic bubble of Japan, Yubari ap applied 
every single pro-growth strategy that was available in the pro-growth uh, handbook of action. So they created the Tanko Kara and Koe from Minds to Tourism Policy to try, as you will know, bring tourists. And they, they got into a frenzy. They started very, very hard to bring back growth. They started building this, uh, everything they could build to attract tourists, tourists. And to do that, to pay for all of this, they were borrowing money. So, you know, like I want to buy a new Prada, uh, Prada bag, so I will gonna take some money for Jorge, and then I want to buy something else. I take more money from Jorge, and after 10, 20 years, I own so much money to Jorge that I cannot pay it back. So that's the root of um, Yuvari's problem. And they created a call, History Village, which started in the 80s with um, a museum, a fossil pavilion, a robot science museum, Adventure Family. So this picture is Adventure Family, which was the largest amusement park in Hokkaido at the time of its opening, a ski resort. Um, at the same time, they were raising over with a bulldozer like taking out all the all the legacy of the mining industry trying to increase the touristic appeal of the city. Um, they also launched the in the Yubari International Fantastic Film Festival to showcase the work of newcomer and international directors and Japanese filmmakers. And have you watched Kill Bill by Quentin Tarantino? If you've watched Kill Bill, there is a character called Yubari. And the character is called Yubari because Quentin Tarantino was invited to this festival when he wasn't famous. So then he named one of the characters under the film festival. They also create, this is very cute, the Kinemadori, which you have the main street of the city with all this recreation of all movies, Western and Japanese. And Yubari was doing very well. Yubari was, became a national example and the government of Japan awarded Yubari its Minister for Local Authorities Prize for its revitalization efforts. So it won a national award. But as you can see here in this graphic, this is the natural balance and migration balance. So natural balance is the number of, uh, do you, I mean, do, I hope you know what is natural balance. So you have births on one side, death on the other. So it's like, what's the difference between death uh, birth and death. So it's negative. There is more people dying than uh, coming into your body. But you can see that the natural balance is more or less stable at 150 people every year. The drama of your body is the people moving out of the city, which in some years is as high as 500 people per year. So you can see how the main problem of your body is clearly not people uh, having enough children, which is also a factor, but it's clearly people people moving out and running away. And they, Yubari went bankrupt in 2006, becoming the first and I believe the only Japanese city to declare bankruptcy up until now. So why? As I mentioned before, debt, finance, touristic attractions. Uh, building a theme park is very expensive. Um, so you have to pay for a theme park. You borrow money. This is not going well. The city has been losing population. So the less people, that means less taxpayers. So there is less people paying taxes. So the city has less money, has less resources to pay back the, the debt. And then with the former prime minister, Koizumi, there was a national decentralization reforms that made cities to be responsible for their finances. And the government had to implement austerity measures. So after the bankruptcy was applied, they have to start uh, cutting down services, such as them grabbing the local hospital to a day clinic, closing all the schools to consolidate. So there was many hard measures. And 
this is something that can be understood as a, um, a slow death. So the slow death is a, a concept developed by Berlant, a, a feminist scholar, which she talks about the physical weighing out of a population and the deterioration of people in that population that is very nearly a defining condition of the experience and historical existence. So it's like a slow death, while slowly, slowly, you are losing the elements that makes a city a city. It's people, it's vitality, it's vitality, it's communities. The more people that move out, the less children that are to have in the school, the less people you have to talk to, the less people you have for your businesses. And this picture, I took it in 2014. This is the site of that theme park I showed you before. So this is what remains of the theme park. And I've read in a newspaper article that the roller coaster was sold to China, which is very, very sad at the same time. And you can see here how all that investment into facilities, what has become. So the, the city went into bankruptcy for something that has not even left a legacy or something that can be enjoyed by the people. But there was a change. It's the mayor Naomichi. He was elected in 2011 as probably one of the youngest mayors. I think he was 30 something when he was elected mayor that they started bringing new action into the city. And he became Hokkaido's governor in 2019 which probably shows his, um, his very popularity in this aspect. And so I think around this moment is when you body change. And this is the important, the important point. So up until now, the city was very hardcore pro-growth. And then they suffered the consequences. Their pro-growth approach had a very, very high cost, the cost of shutting down the hospital, shutting down the schools, shutting down public buses, shutting down the train lines. So the city started to develop a compact city plan with the main emphasis on sustaining quality of life. So there was four very important challenges. So one is how to do this soft landing I was talking before while taking into account aging and entering cage to efficiently manage land resources. Most of the land of many of the houses were public land or land owned by mines. Also how to right size the physical fabric of the city and how to improve connection among the different parts of the city. That, I will talk about that a little bit more uh, in the next slide. But this is a picture that I took. I think this trip was in 2018. I, I've been twice to Yubari. And this was in a community, it's called Mayachi community, where there was uh, six, seven dances um, and only four or five people were still living there. And this was very creepy because you could see the, the footprints of the animals on the snow. And it was January, it was very cold. Um, and yes, it's completely abandoned. It's like one of these zombie movies. So the idea of the, of the compact city plan is to concentrate the remaining population across the areas with the most connection of the city. So this was made through public participation process. So the people of the city was gathered together with different options. In one of them was including, let's do nothing and see what happens. Let's concentrate in one single area. Let's concentrate in different areas. So there were like different options and through different meetings. And it was led by Professor Setoguchi of Hokkaido University. They developed a compact city plan, which has one main area, Shimizusawa, that is the, the main circle, and all the other branches. So the idea was to, we have our community, and the city cannot leave this first. We need to concentrate the city in areas because that's also what allow us to provide public services. You cannot run a bus across a very uh, vast area of the city without um, enough users. But if you concentrate the users, 
you can concentrate the schools, you can concentrate the, the medical services, you can concentrate shops. So here you can see how the focus is no longer growth. The focus is trying to keep your body for the people of your body in the most optimal way so they can preserve their livelihood. And this was happening um, very, also with many difficulties. This is the end, this is the Yubari Honcho, which is the local government area. And this is, I think, uh, this is around the area of Shin Yubari, Shin Yubari Station. So when I, the first time I arrived, there was the train line was going this axis. But after, after 2019, this section of the, of the train line was stopped and the only train station was limited to Shinjubari. So the city was trying, it's, it's like when you are very down, the hits you receive are even worse. So the city was trying to compact this, the city and create this axis, but also the public infrastructure was being um, was being uh, shutting down. Also, uh, JR Hokkaido, maybe you know, it's one of the JR branches that has some of the most difficult issues and it's famous for, it's very difficult to keep providing services um, for, the, for the region. So that was the main idea of their plan. So, so of course, they had an extensive demolition program to right side the city. This is also again from the time it went in 2018 and it was very, they are demolishing, very hardcore, but also, and this is the important, when you think of right sizing, I think the main thing that comes to our mind is demolition, is this. You are gonna right size, you are gonna start demolishing, taking off things, knocking down buildings, and you are just gonna have to create land for whatever use. But you already realize that communities also need places to gather. So, um, uh, they started building new social infrastructure. So, for example, you know how centers are more than just a place to go and get a bath. There are places where people gather together, talk, communities are shaped. So, for example, they built a new public bath to help to create this social infrastructure. So, while before, the focus was on building things for outsiders. They built the theme park for the people to come to Yubari. There are not enough people in Yubari to have a theme park running every, every day of the year. So they were building for people outside. To now, they started building things for the people in Yubari. So for example, the Cento, or also this a new building that I, ha I have never been here. It's open, I think, last year. It's called Risuta, which is a new social center that includes the bus station, uh, a bus hub, a transportation hubs, the library, and also rooms that you can rent for several activities and a place for children to gather. This also happened because once the, um, the train stopped, this, is, um, this was a way to communicate the city. So right sizing that and imply not doing anything implies trying to build smartly and trying to build the things that are going to benefit the city, the people in the city. So this facility, you have the library, you have a small cafe, you can gather spaces, mother can go with their children, there are places to play around. So this is a place for the community. This is not a place for me that I go one day to Yubari I buy a melon and I enjoy some food and then come back to my home. This is the, this is the very paradigm shift is really trying to focus on their own. Or for example, something as important as construction, constructing affordable housing in consolidated areas. So this very nicely looking house uh, is in the Shimizusawa area. And there are very important things like once you are old, stairs are no longer your friend. So since Yubari's population is predominantly old people, most of the new housing is one single floor because it's very hard for elderly people to have to climb. 
and they are also very well uh, insulated. So as you can see, there is a considerable amount of snow, but the whole area is trying to, br to bring the best quality possible for the people in the city. And if you are going to live in the city, you need a decent housing because most of the old housing from the miners didn't have insulation, have poor windows, they have too many stiff steps. It wasn't a place where the elderly or people who has lost their job could be able to live happily. So the city start changing the part of their focus, really. That was the main message I want to say here. And they also started doing the post uh, new social initiatives. I'm sure, do you know Furusato no Sei? Yes, I'm sure you know Furusato no Sei. I need to do it this year. Uh, I need help from a friend to do it. Also, they started doing crowdfunding campaigns to support the city's high school. And it reached 23 million yen. And also the Shimizusawa Community Gate to reutilize abandoned mining housing, which was again, it's this idea of trying to preserve the people and trying to keep the city running as a normal city, despite the bankruptcy, despite the depopulation, despite all the terrible things that has happened to Yuvali. And now I'm going to show you a video because they also created a new campaign called Restart, Challenge More, which Restart, I think Katakana, you, you call it Risuta. So that's why that facility I was showing you before is called Risuta because it's the restart of your body. So now I think the video is like three minutes. I hope you can listen the audio. Let me try. If you cannot listen, please let me know. Uh, uh, yes. You are a tower to Mamoka. You are a new one. You are a new one. You are a これ顔を投げたのか。夕張の夜明けはまだか。闇よ。自分たちでぶち壊せ。ここに残った数の高齢者は知恵だ。シンクの朝日が今登る As you can see the video, the first part of the video, if you still remember, it goes with all the things that probably would be in the, in the minds of an average Japanese person when you talk about Yubari, full of elderly people, uh, only the minds, nothing remains, all the negative things that are what is well known about Yubari. But then the video creates this sort of narrative that there are people, there are a spite in a spirit, and it's really I think it's really uh, it's a really clear invitation that we have to get rid of the growth ideology because that's not helping you, buddy. It's also th something when you are labeled as being something bad, it's very difficult to change 
that image. And I don't think, and I think that Japan is a very nice place to be. Um, if you haven't, I think I invite you to really uh, get there. So I think the main lesson from Yubari, and this is what we want to talk about alternatives, sustainable alternatives. Yubari is no longer trying to grow. It's trying to keep a compact city to re uh, reduce its built up area, but more importantly, to sustain quality of life and having new social up to date infrastructure. So it's a, this change from one approach to another, what is really creating Yubari, this new narrative. And, but also it has to, to survive. The city's depopulation keeps growing. So they need to create conditions for people to live and avoid out migration and bringing new people. Because I think we talked last week that uh, one of the main reasons people move out is because of lack of jobs. But surveys by the city of Yubari and the national census show that there are around 500 people who commute to Yubari for work every day. So Yubari has jobs, but people are still choosing not to live in Yubari and live either in Chitose or Sapporo or other areas in towns in the vicinity. So Yubari still is trying to really create the conditions for those people who have jobs in Yubari, maybe can stay, but more importantly, to keep uh, the social infrastructure up to life. So the question is, uh, for how long can Yubari continue? And how long can this keep going on? Because the population seems not to stop, but I think that there will be a chance to do it. And also if you are doing your Furusato no Sei and you have no particular city, also, please consider uh, donating to your body or to talk to your parents or other places. I think it's good. I, although I have no interest in your body, I have no share into the city. So it is just, uh, I, those are, I use this for the city I research. Anyway, the next case, Imabetsu. So Imabetsu, uh, the reason why it's famous is because it's the smallest municipality in Japan connected to the Shinkansen network. So it's uh, the smallest city place in Japan, not a city, it's a town with a Shinkansen station. Uh, it received the Shinkansen in 2016. Its current population is 2,335 inhabitants. Its population peaked was way smaller than Yubari. It peaked at 8,144 people, especially with the um, there was a lot, of, a lot of employment employment during the construction of the second tunnel. And more than 50% of its population is 65 years or older. And it's also similar to you, it has a very dispersed uh, settlement system. But I think the reason why I started researching Mabetsu was because I was very uh, surprised when traveling around Akita that there was this is this is station in a place I've never heard of and that didn't seem to have much things to do, but there was a Shinkansen station. So you can see here, it's a huge building in the middle of nowhere. And in Mabetsu, it's really hoping that the Shinkansen was gonna change its fate, it's gonna help it to grow. And the question we are asking with the case of Himabetsu is, can the Shinkansen be a source for sustainable revitalization? And also, how is Himabetsu trying to take advantage of this opportunity? And similar to Yubari, there are two stages. There's a more clear pro-growth and an awakening from that pro-growth dream or nightmare to change things. So this first stage, it's, more, it's all about the Shinkansen. And it's more or less between 2015 and 2020. So the case of Imabetsu is way more recent. And the municip and the policies of the city at that time had very high hopes for the Shinkansen. Um, it was hoping to increase tourism, as you all know, pr to promote resettlement, something that in Japanese is called Yutan, Haitan, Jeitan, um, or improve local employment opportunities. But uh, the idea was that with the Shinkansen, it was so as a blessing because it will improve tourism. You know, people can go easily to the city. 
increase the number of tourists and overnight stays, bring school trips to the town, promote green and blue tourism, and also back in the days, uh, promote the sports related tourism, especially the Olympic training camps, because Imabetsu has a particular form of a sport which is very ancient and they are very proud of their sport legacy. And again, the Shinkansen was the very, very important part of the re regenerations, including facilitate children's coming into a school, support branding and strategies of local products. So now there is an Imabetsu view, similar to Kobe or other famous uh, beef uh, products from Japan. Also expand the economic reach of the region and support economic activities that will attract reverse migrants. Um, but if you remember the map I show at the beginning with the shrinkage of Japan, there were two prefectures, only two prefectures with a population decline over 10%. There were um, three of them actually, Fukushima, uh, Aomori, and Akita. So Imabetsu is at the farther, if you see here in the, in the map, it's in the very top of the Tsugaru Peninsula. So it's in a very isolated position. So this is what, um, with my co-author or Marco, we call it like, but there is nothing here. Because once you go to Imabetsu, you realize there's this hoax versus reality. And my first experience when visiting Imabetsu is that indeed there is, for example, once you reach to the station of Kutsugaru Imabetsu, if I don't have a driving license, so I cannot go easily to places, and I had to rent a bike to go to the town, which it was okay because it was summer, but you can imagine uh, going to Aomori in December might not be the best option to rent a bike and have a seven, eight kilometers journey with the snow through wild roads. Um, so there are, I think one of the main lessons is like there are many limitations to what this approach can actually achieve. And also that it is very entrenched in a pro-growth narrative and it's outward oriented. So as we were talking, discussing about the case of Yubari, at first, most of the initiatives are trying to show to people outside of the city. So we want to bring tourism, we want to bring this and that, but what's there for the people living in the city? And also because the, um, the issue like the Shinkansen was, very, was welcomed with very unrealistic expectations. So the Shinkansen is not a positive factor in and of itself. So the impacts are very unevenly distributed among connected municipalities. So if you, if you see, this is the extension of the Shinkansen in Aomori Prefecture. So, uh, so you have Mino, uh, no, Minohi is still Iwada. You have Hachinohe, Shichinohe, Towada, Shinaomori, and Okutsugaru Imabetsu. So um, the town that is doing the best out of them is uh, Shichinohe, which probably you know that uh, Nishizawa, Ryu Nishizawa San built a museum there. And it's also access to Lake Towada. But Imabetsu is there in a small corner far away. Um, and it's like more, uh, more difficult to access. So the key lesson that Imabetsu has been learning is that the Shinkansen, only the Shinkansen is not going to solve its problems. It's like having, um, having some, some ingredients to cook. You can make your ingredients into the most delicious plate dish, or you can completely waste them and put too much salt and that is not tasty. So the Shinkansen doesn't have enough power to move something forward. And then there was the issue of like, there was a lack of resources and infrastructure. And the city was questioning how to achieve the expected uh, revitalization. So I think around 2021 this is the most recent set of policies that I have been reading, also because they are the most recent ones. Um, the city has started changing its approach, it's very similar to Yubari, but what in Yubari happened in a long period of time, in Imabetsu is happening in a shorter period of time. 
So even though the Shinkansen is still central to the, to the city, it is no longer the center. And the objective is to make the most of what the town has and increase the quality of life. So the town is also trying to set up services to keep kindergarten for work, uh, working mothers, to keep public services for the elderly, to provide medical care. And even though some of the previous policies are still in place, they are now tuned down. So they are like more smooth to acknowledge the limited financial resources of the city. So this new approach, so this re-emergence of Yubari is creating a more realistic approach to tourism, which they realized because in the first plans, they were saying, we want tourists to stay overnight. Problem, there were no hotels. So where do you want me to stay overnight? In a camping site or the Shinkansen wasn't connected to the town, so this is not very practical. They are also now reusing, they have built a new gymnasium with accommodation for school trips. So trying to capitalize in their sports legacy to bring uh, new children and younger people to stay for a couple of days, do a training workshops and bring this vitality back. Reuse Akiya for touristic attractions and also to capitalize in the town's resources. It's like, for example, produce renewable energy within the town, uh, windmills. So this talking about the economic uh, environmental transition and the transition to a, a low carbon society, also to support healthy living and caring for the elderly, elderly, to improve transport between the town and the station. So this is the train you have to take after you get off of the station, which is very badly coordinated, and also to create a town where people want to live, but also for the people of the town to stay. So the thing is like, in Mabetsu is slowly moving towards a more balanced conceptualization of what can be achieved. So in mobility base is reconceptualizing population also. So now the thing about related population, people that don't live in Mabetsu, but are engaged with the town, and there is a clear focus on the town's human resources, promoting health, promoting work-life balance, promoting welfare. So the people of the town are benefiting the most out of the things available to them. And also looking from within, Japan has pledged to, to become carbon neutral by 2050. That means that their CO2 emissions will be zero by that date. But the situation, like it's very, very, very hard for cities like Yokohama, Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya to produce enough renewable energy for their own consumption because the consumption of energy in Tokyo is so high that there is not a space within the city of Tokyo to produce renewable energy. So now that I start having partnerships between rural areas and larger cities in which the rural the cities give money to the rural areas to develop renewable energy facilities and then transfer this, uh, this low carbon energy to the cities. Kind of like, you do this for me, I give you some resources and then you give me your renewable energy. So that's just start happening and that's helping to achieve carbon neutrality. And again, the main idea is to improve quality of life. So even though in the case of Yubari, there was already many examples of uh, social infrastructure being built, Imabetsu is still at an early stage. So there is not so many elements that has been already completed. But for example, um, the, this is the new gymnasium that has been built to, with some accommodations to, again, the city is very famous for its sports. It's something that makes it unique. So let's take that. Rather than competing with generic things, trying to compete with what makes you strong and unique. And I think that you had, uh, in Abed, so just, you still have this very uh, strong quest, uh, tension. So that is the tension between pro-growth and sustainable approaches. 
So even though the city has no longer the very high hopes for the that the Shinkansen will bring a lot of growth, a lot of growth, and there's a lack of resources and capacity at the municipal level to help a shrinkage, the city is moving towards a new direction. Um, there is hopes and efforts that still clash, and there is this, nar this lingering narrative of doom, which links to what we were mentioning before, the stigma of Hesring Gates there is, and the growth ideology. There is no life without growth. There is no, um, there is no future without growth. You have to grow. So that obsession with growth creates this narrative of doom in which there is no future without growth. But also the city is learning to find what they have and what's the real potential. So they are rethinking what means to rethink to what means local revitalization. They are finding new mobilities supported by the Shinkansen. So rather than thinking of the Shinkansen as your savior, as the element that is gonna to take away all your issues, it's like a miracle diet. If you eat broccoli for six days, you will lose a lot of weight. Things doesn't work like that. You need more elements just, that just a miracle diet. So they are thinking how the Shinkansen can really be implemented to benefit the city, and also how to find the elements in the area to stimulate the local economy, but from a more sustainable point of view. So this is all for the case of Imabetsu. And I think that these are the questions that probably we can have. Today I did better, I did shorter uh, talk that we can talk now together. Also, if you have any further question is, can a shrinking cities help to rethink current plan approaches to planning? And also, what is your role as a young architect in addressing these issues? Because you are going to be working if you decide to take architectural practice or you decide to take urban design, you will be working if you stay in Japan as well in the context on, of the population. You are going to be working in that context. And also, can architecture help? And if so, how? So those are three questions that I want to open for the discussion.